Hey everybody, my name is Jonathan Corin. In today's marketing talk, I'm going to be talking to the content marketing manager for a SaaS company in Redmond, Washington. My guest today, Zach Boyd, has a background in music and marketing, working with different thought leaders on their copywriting and marketing strategy. If you want to see some of his copywriting in action, visit HireZachBoyd.com or DateZachBoyd.com. You will thoroughly enjoy his writing style on both websites. Thanks for hopping on this call, Zach. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, God, God, we got the thorough, um, the thorough introduction there. If you have any, if you have any ideas for other ZachBoyd.com uh, domains, I've probably already bought them. So a little <laughs> bit of a Squarespace problem. <laughs> so I don't necessarily endorse Squarespace. I just somehow ended up there. Uh, they're kind of a pain in the butt, but you know, here we are. If it ain't I love Squarespace. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I love Squarespace. I think it's super simple, but it's it's interesting seeing some of the the comments that you mentioned on your hire Zach boy saying, hey, if you want me to build you a Squarespace website, I'm probably not your guy. So <laughs> Wrong guy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I can do it. it. It will be there. It just won't look good or work right, but here we are. <laughs> there you go. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for hopping on this call. Uh, but the first question I want to kick off with is just kind of, uh, you know, right now we're going through a global pandemic and obviously it's affected everybody um, across the world. And so I'm just curious right now, how are you as a marketer adjusting to COVID-19 and has it affected you much? Have you had to adapt much to it? Uh, you know, I, I'm privileged to be in the category of people for whom this is just inconvenient. Meaning, you know, my lifestyle isn't threatened. It's not a serious health risk for me. It's just annoying. Um, and well, that's not nothing. You know, I know there are a lot of people who have been much more impacted. Um, for me, you know, I'm here. I have my books. You know, I have a PS4. I've played more in the last two months than any other time in my life. And, uh, I, you know, kind of thriving in my best introvert life. Um, to a marketing perspective, I'm kind of on the tech job side, not so much. Um, the tech company I work at is actually was pretty well positioned for this. Um, and then working with the Heroes Journal, uh, which is the business I'm a part of, we do have some manufacturing stuff that was delayed. Um, and actually, I think uh, later on, we're going to get into some marketing campaigns. And we were able to build a campaign that was helpful for people at this time um, that struck really well. But for the most part, no, it's, it's me sitting at home on my couch with my coffee and my laptop, you know, staring at a blank Google document, which is pretty much normal marketing life anyway. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and before this, this, uh, actual hitting record on this call, uh, we had talked about, you know, just how you, uh, usually don't like to, uh, look at emails or stuff like that until later in the day, just so you focus a majority of your creativity or most, a majority of your focus on the first part of the day, just producing and, you know, creating these. Yeah. Yeah. I try to, um, th there's, I have like broad personal theory around how I structure my schedule. Um, there's, I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, an online essay called Maker's Time versus Manager's Time. That's really worthwhile. Or um, Cal Newport wrote a book called Deep Work. Um, I wasn't a big fan of digital minimalism by him, which a lot of people were, so I might need to reread it. Um, but it, I'm way oversimplifying it. His basic premise is just like there's the kind of work that is meaningful or the kind of work I think I get hired to do is work I can't do in 30 minute chunks. Um, and so I try to be really, really careful about getting a good, you know, two to four hour chunk of time in the morning where I'm just trying to figure out what's the, what's like the biggest project I need to be working on right now. Um, and then I just push all of the, you know, as much of the checking my email, going to meetings, like doing the corporate stuff, I try to push to the afternoon as much as possible. Um, for me, that's been a really good work schedule. I know people who do the inverse, but I like having quiet mornings and it's me and my thoughts trying to, you know, get the best work done um, and making space for really meaningful work. Yeah, that's great. I'm actually right now just about to finish deep work with Cal Newport. I read it two years ago and I'm oh, nice. reading it now. So it's, it's good. It's a good refresh, especially working from home. So now to dive more deeper into, you know, really how you landed in marketing, you mentioned on your website, hirezachboyd.com that you've been different things from a social media intern to a session cellist to a wedding MC. I'm sure a lot of other things you didn't add on there. How did you, like, can you walk us through how you eventually like, you know, worked your way through to an actual marketing position? I saw that you were an, uh, an EDR for this tech company. Um, and I actually heard that you didn't really like it much. So I'm just curious, how did you finally get into marketing? Can you just walk, give us a brief run yeah. on how you got from point A to point B? Yeah. Well, it's the, uh, patent pending Zach Boyd, uh, marketing career path. Uh, one I wouldn't recommend to anyone on the ever, uh, but it worked out 
um, it starts. So if you want to, you know, you want to follow, you know, follow in my footsteps, start by getting really depressed and failing out of college. Um, so that's like step number one. Uh, step number two is play in a band with somebody who works at this tech company you've never heard of and is like, Hey, we're hiring salespeople. And you're like, I've never done sales. Uh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Um, I was actually working at a restaurant here in Kirkland and this guy came in and he was like, Hey, you're good at talking to people. You should come work for me. It turns out he was a VP of sales at this same tech company my friend in the band played at. And so I went in and interviewed, I knew nothing about it. Um, I was just a smart ass little kid. Like this, your VP like recommended me, you're going to hire me. Um, didn't know anything about the job. Um, and actually for my first three months in that job was working as uh, an SDR cold calling. And then, um, would still work at the restaurant at night. Cause I was like, I don't know if this thing's real. Like this still feels like a weird pyramid scheme. I've never had a corporate job. I don't know how any of this works. Like money shows up every two weeks. That's cool. Um, but while I had some successes in SDR, I pretty quickly realized I didn't want to cold call for the rest of my life. It was just like, I can do this, but I, you know, it was a lot. My introverted self would be like driving home at night, just like quiet, like finally not talking to anybody. Um, but I also had to face a realization and that was that I didn't know how to do anything that people would want to pay me money for. It was like, I, I knew I didn't want a cold call, but that was probably the only thing I knew how to do that somebody would hire me to do. Um, and so I started looking around in the business, just like, well, I've, I've made it this far. Like, where could I go? What could I do here? That, uh, would be not cold calling would be interesting. I looked at sales leadership pretty quickly was like, that seems like a trap. Um, which I would still kind of just not for me. Um, looked to doing a handful of other things and looked at marketing, um, and marketing at this tech company at the time had a lot of needs. And I, I just reached out to a couple of people. My, my strategy, I'm a reader. Um, I kind of always have been though that picked up, especially at this time of my life. Um, you know, my way of trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be a sales manager was I Googled sales manager reading list and there were three books and I bought all 23 of them and I read all 23 of them. And then I was like, I don't want to do this. So I got rid of them. Um, but started reaching out to people in marketing asking, you know, Hey, what, you have some book recommendations. And, and this is like, this is a life hack. This is a real thing. So if you're listening to this, this will work for you, but you probably won't be the person to do it. It's been my experience. If you go to somebody in a company and you ask for a book rec recommendation, you're not unusual. But if you actually read the book, you're probably the only person who did it. Like everybody asks for recommendations. Nobody reads the books. And I was like, I'll read the books. So for whatever reason that got me a little bit further with those people ended up over the next six months, reading a bunch of books, found out that the company I was at had interviewed a bunch of copywriters and not been able to find anything. And I was like, that's writing in the title. How hard could it be? Right. Um, read a bunch of books on copywriting, reached out. I ended up saying, Hey, I will, you know, you guys have copywriting needs. I'm still cold calling at this point when I quit my second job, I was like, Hey, if you need something written, I'll write it tonight. You can put your name on it. You just have to let me know how it works. And um, got a couple of like writing projects and, and to the credit of the people there, they gave me credit for it. And pretty quickly we were like, all right, we'll, we'll hire you. Um, so that was kind of my, my scattershot journey into a marketing role as a, I think I was a marketing copywriter. I don't know. I don't know what the word in front of copywriter really meant. Mar strategic copywriter, marketing copywriter, so, you know, who knows? Uh, writing words uh, for a marketing team. That's kind of my, scattershot career path. And and that's uh interesting. Yeah. As far as like the, the, the corporate jargon, I'm, I'm, you know, insert whatever you want before or after the actual main role. Um, but like, I'm, I'm curious because it helps like understanding, like you have book, whole bunch of books around you. Um, and you mentioned you read all these books. Like I agree. I, I I've had different conversations. It's interesting because I've talked to different people about, you know, them talking to different business leaders, whether, whether it's them wanting to start their own business or do their own thing. A lot, a lot of the time, the people who actually want to learn actually take the action that, you know, people are suggesting, Hey, read this or do this or, you know, take this sort of action. And it's interesting that you did that and that you ultimately landed in an area that's interesting to you. So I'm curious, now, how did you like outside of reading, um, and, and maybe it is just writing, how did you teach yourself copywriting outside of just reading it? Because obviously there's learning it, but then there's actually applying mm -hmm. it. How'd you, how, how was that? Uh, how did that play out? Yeah, I think there were a couple of things that I got really lucky with. Um, one, I was working with really good leaders. Um, gal by the name of Becca, who is still a really good friend of mine who, um, believed in me a lot kind of saw a lot of potential. And then is also just somebody who did the work herself. Very, very talented. Um, 
and, and many other people like that. So, so that got lucky because you, you won't necessarily end up with good leaders. And that's a really tough position to be in. Um, two, I would say, um, I, I think there's two strategies or two ways you can apply the strategy. Do as much work as you can. Um, especially when you're new and you don't have a full plate. The nice thing about being in a new role is you're not responsible for very much, right? You might have a job responsibility, but in terms of this marketing team has already been functioning for a long time. People have already been getting things done for a long time. They're going to keep doing that and you're going to have a lot of free time. It's just a reality. So what most people, most people are like, I'm going to wait for my manager to tell me to do something because I'm afraid I'm going to mess something up. And I would just say, go find, go say yes to everything that you can. Um, for me as a new member of the marketing team, the first way I did that was just internally. It was just like, oh, product marketing doesn't have a good writer on their team. I'll write all your guys' stuff for you. Um, so I, I was like, I can now say I have some product marketing experience, which actually played out really well for me later in my career. Um, hey, our digital team, just like, hey, I, I wrote you guys these ads. Do you want to try this, right? Just, just finding every single place. There is so much need in every marketing team has been my experience at least that if you're just showing up saying, Hey, give me more stuff to work on. You can grow super fast because most people don't want to do the work themselves. That's true. That's fair. I, I'm the same way. Um, and there's just that latent opportunity to say, Hey, I, I helped with this. What do you think? What could I do better? How could I grow? And, and pretty quickly, at least my experience was you'll go from like, Hey, thanks for doing this, but it doesn't work for these reasons to, Hey, we're actually using this to, Hey, the thing you made actually worked really well. Um, and then just the other thing I got kind of lucky with was uh, kind of falling my way into some freelance work, um, which if, if you have the bandwidth to do it is one of the best investments you can make in yourself. Um, even if you're not getting paid very much, that's fine. It just means that you're taking the marketing skills that you're growing, learning and growing at one company and you're able to apply them to a new customer base, a new marketing segment. Maybe even you go from B to B to B to C. Um, or just direct to consumer, like there, you're going to learn so much taking those reps while you're reading and then reading as well, um, as well as some digital courses. And I would say those three things working together, um, good leaders taking a lot of swings at the ball, just practice, and then the right information um, were all really helpful for me. I think especially just learning, I'm not going to say I've mastered copywriting because I, th I think mastery takes a lot longer but like getting that, that kind of baseline of like, this is something I could do for most companies and be, you know, in the top percentile of copywriters for most companies. Um, yeah. So I'm curious specifically about copywriting right now. I, I began like, as I'm finishing up deep work, I, at the same time, like, I don't know if you read the same way, but you kind of start one, another book too, depending mm -hmm. on where you're at. But like, it's hard for me. Like I get interested about so many different things. So I recently started, uh, Ogilvy on advertising. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great book. Um, and so, and so my question to you specifically is, um, yep, that's a, that I have that same hard copy. Yep. Yep. There you go. Oh, Do you yeah, also have the, un, the unpublished Ogilvy? I might uh, have another one of his. Anyway, yeah, sorry, so, continue. So, so, yeah. So obviously da David Ogilvy is one of the OG, you know, um, mm -hmm. guys in copywriting. And so I'm curious, like just from your experience, do you think everybody is fit to become a copywriter or at least learn some sort of like writing skills? Or do you think it's a specific type of personality, obviously? And it, this is going in line more with your career. You did sales. Mm -hmm. You're like, hey, I realize I can do it. I just don't like it. And so I'm curious in the same thing, like, you know, there's some people out there that are seeing a lot more, more and more content, specifically on LinkedIn. There's a lot more copywriting, um, th th different thought leaders sharing a lot of stuff on their Twitter. There's so many different means. And so I'm just curious, do you think everybody has the capability of becoming a copywriter or do you think it's for a specific type of person? It's a really good question. W what I would say is that I, it, I struggle to think of a single organization being a good copywriter would not be immensely useful to you. Um, you think about being a CEO, writing a letter to everybody at the company, it would probably be useful. And, and I'm thinking of copywriting, not just, I'll, I'll maybe separate it. There's like convert, there's CRO, conversion rate optimization copywriting. I don't think everybody can do, and I don't think it's something everybody needs to do. Um, there's copywriting more in the traditional writing sense, which is I know how to clearly uh, state what I'm thinking and ask for what I want. And that's something I think everybody can do. I'm not going to say everybody can do it equally well. Um, like I do think that there are some people who are like the David Ogilvy's, right? They're clearly better at doing that. You don't have to write a face. Like doing that doesn't mean you can write a great Facebook ad, 
but you would have the skills to write a great Facebook ad. And I think, I think whether you're a manager, whether you're a salesperson, you're in customer support, those skills, the ability to write and persuade are like, to me, really fundamental to the way I think about solving any problem for a business. Um, but I think useful for everyone. Um, it does everybody's brain work that way. In my experience, more people's brains work that way than don't. I think there's maybe a bottom 10% of people that just don't care enough. And that's okay. But like maybe the really, really highly analytical people um, think much more in terms of numbers and logistics and that's okay. Um, I think even those people could, could learn a thing or two about it and benefit from it. Um, so yeah, I would say like the, the very top end, like I'm going to write an advertisement. I'm going to, you know, do conversion optimization, optimization stuff. I think that's a, a more specialized version of copywriting, but I think everybody should, or w I will say everybody would benefit from having copywriting skills. And I think it's a pretty reasonable barrier of entry because to me, it really gets back to, it's not some special magical voodoo. It's just like, it's your ability to communicate clearly and succinctly and empathize with somebody else's point of view. So I, I, I'm not just saying words that make sense to me. I'm understanding you and your context and I'm using the words that would make sense to you to deliver some form of value. And I, I struggle to think of a single job at any business where that's not a valuable thing to have up your sleeve. Yeah, I, I think that's a really valuable insight. And before I segue into the next question, I'm just curious for anybody out there that's curious on dabbling or beginning their journey within copywriting, what are the top three books or things that they should you know read right now to 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 begin the, the, the that journey? It's a really good question. The first one I have off the hip would be um, Copy Hackers is a blog um, run by Joanna Weeb. I I don't know if I'm saying her last name right, W-E-I-B-E, -E, um, that you have to dig for a little bit on their website, but there's three hours of free videos that just talk about the basics of copywriting and then the basics of how to write a headline. It's honestly enough. Like if you could just master that three hours of content, you would be further than most people. Um, it's really about, she gets into like understanding your audience. Books wise, I don't know if I have any crazy books up my sleeve. I, I do like uh, Confessions of, a, of an Advertising Man. Um, or on advertising by Ogilvy. Both are a little bit grandiose. He's using them to build his business, um, but his points are very, very well founded. Um, really thinking about the audience's perspective and being able to measure your results, I think are really, really key. For my third one, I'll go with, um, I'll go with Influence by Robert Gialdini. Um, I have a really, really beat up copy. Uh, this book is by a guy who holds dual degrees in psychology and marketing, uh, doctorate degrees in psychology and marketing at the university of Arizona, at least at the time he wrote his book. Um, it was paid by fortune 500 companies to do a bunch of research about what convinces people to buy basically. Um, and he identifies basically six forms of persuasion or influence that you can use, um, from kind of like reciprocity to social proof, um, that to me has been like really, really helpful in how I think about kind of the, the larger framework of what am I trying to do with my copywriting here? And this book will also just explain to you a lot of the words people who want to teach you thing will use. Great. Yeah, no, I, I think that, uh, thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm for sure. Personally, like I mentioned, I'm already reading Ogilvy on advertising, but I'm, I'm going to check out that blog that you mentioned. I'm going to for sure do that as soon as possible. Really, I'm finding it's really accessible. Yeah, I appreciate that. So now kind of segueing into the next section is um, you obviously you're working uh, for this tech company, but you also alluded that you do some freelance work. You know, you, you've worked with different thought leaders on different um, product launches, course launches, different, um, you know, at campaigns. And, and it's interesting because there was actually one specifically about uh, I'll, I'll just share it real quick. Uh, you, you had mentioned that you received a sales letter from a real estate agent and uh, it was horribly written where you actually called them. I think it was like 8 p.m. on a Saturday and you ended up uh, rewriting one for them for $200. And so um, and I just thought that was really interesting because, you know, it, it, it one, it caught your attention and you actually took action and delivered. And uh, I'm curious on what the outcome was for that. But um, maybe you can answer that after you answer this question as you, you've had you know, you've worked with different people. What's been like the most successful campaign that you've uh, launched to this date and, and, and why was it successful? Yeah, well, I'll wrap both those answers into sort of ones. So uh, four years ago, I guess, I, I just got my first copywriting job and I was cocky and arrogant as I'll get out as most new copywriters are. 
I'm not saying I'm not still, I'm just saying I'm better than I was then. So maybe I've earned it. Probably not. Uh, but I was in my basement and uh, a friend of mine, this guy, Nick Vitalaro, was with me at the time. Not, sorry, not living with me. We just, he had a room in the same house. We were roommates for like a month and a half. Long story. Where this, the story ends up is that we started a business together, which is my most successful campaign to date. Um, but it's like 8 p.m., we're in like, we're in my basement. He's just like saying hi. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I got this letter from this real estate agent and it's horrible. And I've been thinking about calling him all day, offering to write a better one. He's like, you should do it. And if, if he hadn't been there, I don't think I would have done it. It was kind of that, like, you know, your, your friends like, like, no, you won't like, you don't have it in you. So I called him. And of course that guy's sitting there thinking like, oh yeah, I got, I got somebody to bite on my letter. And I was just like, I don't I don't remember what I did. I think Nick has video somewhere, but I was just like, you know, yeah, like you seem to be like, you probably send a lot of these letters, huh? Like how many responses do you get? And he was like, well, not that many. And I was like, yeah, you know, you're probably like spending a lot of resources getting these letters out to people. Like, don't you think it would be worthwhile to like maybe make the letter work? He had like spelling mistakes in it, all these things. I was like, I want somebody to like handle selling your million dollar home. And you're like, you don't even know how to like, write a letter. I was just, I don't know. It was one of those, like, you're just going for the moon because you have nothing to lose. Anyway, ended up writing the guy a new letter for a couple hundred bucks. I don't know how well it worked for him. I don't know how long he was involved in real estate, but that friend Nick, um, a couple of years later hit me up like, Hey, I'm starting a Kickstarter. I have this business idea for a productivity journal. Um, and a year after that, a year after a uh, 150%, you know, Kickstarter and a lot of things, uh, we found it at the beginning of quarantine. So, we were supposed to have a bunch of journals, you know, we've been selling these, um, heroesjournal.co, selling these productivity journals for a long time. And we were supposed to have a bunch show up. I'm not getting at the dates quite right, but basically due to COVID-19, our manufacturing was pushed back a couple of months. And so we were supposed to have more stock show up. We'd been sold out for a month. Um, and we were kind of faced with this, Hey, we, we have people asking us when, when is it going back in stock? When can we buy again? We're trying to figure out how much stock do we need for the end of the year. There's kind of all these logistical questions, right? Small business is three people, Nick, Kyle, and Zach. And like, we're all in our 20s. Like, like I don't know, man. Like, how many do you think we should order? Um, but it, it kind of clicked for us. You know, the, the Heroes Journal is designed to take you basically out. It's like a 90-day productivity journal. So you define like a 90-day goal. And then it's designed to help keep you on track with that goal, kind of using the power of personal narrative and story. And it occurred to us like, man, with with people going into quarantine and people's lives being thrown off, um, some people like me, they're just like, and it's inconvenient. Some people in much more tragic and hard ways. Um, we really felt like there was an opportunity to do something for free, do a free version of our product to help keep people on track through quarantine. So we spun together this, you know, the, the hero, it's like the hero's journal. It's very like fantasy lore driven. There's artwork. And so we just put together this thing called the quarantine quest designed to be like little daily things to help keep you on track. Um, and that is to date the most successful. We ran, we ran paid advertising behind it and basically tripled our email list, um, paying like 15 cents an email, which is by far the like absurdly best number I've ever gotten in my career. Um, and to me, that was an intersection of a couple of things. It was one, a, a very, very sincere offer from us. It wasn't like a, we can capitalize on this. It's like, we actually really help people out and grow our business at the same time. Um, and then two, that matched with um, kind of the times, right? It's like, you can put together the best campaign, but if that best campaign isn't timely to what's happening in the world, it's probably not going to go as well um, as something that really capitalizes on a specific period of time and, and capitalizes too strong a verb there. Um, but we were able to triple our email list leading into pre-orders as a business. Um, and I would say that's the best, at least of late, the best campaign um, in recent memory. So I'm curious specifically, what was the, um, it, it just, you don't have to go into too much detail, but I'm just curious, what was yeah. the positioning? What was the um, value value offered to them? Like, what, can you just describe that a little bit so I get a little bit of a, a better understanding? Totally. Yeah. So where my copywriter brain went is like, hey, most of these people are stuck at home, right? Um, there's not a whole lot of new things happening in your life, right? It's like, I don't know what day of the week it is because it really doesn't matter anymore, right? I, like I, you make jokes about that, but like, that's an experience I think we've all had of just like, what day is it? Is it a weekend? Like, does it matter? You know? Um, and so you think there's a lot of listlessness. There's a lot of like, 
lack of interest. Um, there's maybe some hopelessness in, in some instances of just like, there's a lot of like confusion and anxiety about when this is going to end. And so we came in with not, we can't solve quarantine. We can't cure COVID. Um, we can't let you back outside again. We can't come over. What we can do is say, Hey, there's a, a Facebook group of people going through a similar thing. And we're going to build a little community um, around these kind of daily challenges, as well as like journaling, reflecting stuff with cool artwork you can color in. That's going to bring a little bit of structure to quarantine. Right. Again, I, I think with marketing, it's like, you don't want to, you don't want to promise something so small, nobody cares. But if you promise something too grandiose, people check out, we say, we're going to make this the best month of your life. It's like, I don't know. Like, are you really like, I don't really believe you personally. Um, and I think most people feel that way, but if you can show up and say, Hey, I can reasonably help you out with something that, that, that feels very aspirational. Like I would like to stay on course for this month, but also like friendly and within the realm of what I consider to be possible. Um, for me, that's what I, where I like to live as a marketer, not like I'm, you're going to lose 50 pounds and we're going to cure your marriage. And like, you know, all these things are going to happen if you give me a hundred dollars. It's like, I don't, I don't think so. Um, but rather saying, Hey, we can, we can actually help you out. It'll be a little bit more difficult than you want it to be, but it will work. Um, is to me a much, uh, a much more kind of 21st century approach to messaging. So, so I'm sure there's some people that are curious out there, like where are you guys at right now with, um, with the actual heroes journal, obviously things have been pushed out, but like, you know, in case people are interested in finding out more specifically about that, like, you know, where are you guys at with right now with that? Yeah, we, um, we had our most successful pre-order launch to date, um, which was really exciting. Um, really grateful to kind of our audience and everybody who's our customers, everybody who's been with us. Um, as of now, we still have journals available for pre-order um, and we have more coming. So you can check it out at the, if you're interested, you want to learn more at the heroes journal.co. Um, that's the, and then H E R O S journal.co. Um, but yeah, we're, um, we're, we should have enough inventory to keep us going for uh, through the end of the year, hopefully um, though given the way people buy them. I don't know if we'll make it quite to then. Great. Now I'm glad to hear that you were able to tie both of those stories together, the real estate and then obviously the heroes journal piece too. And I'm, and congrats on the success on that too. I think that's a, that's a great, Thank great you. milestone, especially when it's something that, you know, you're, you're playing a part in actually growing and, and building. So that's, I'm sure that's super fulfilling. So you're surrounded by tons of books. You're, uh, I, I'm, I'm I haven't curious. read any of them. I just put them there to impress people on Zoom calls. <laughs> it was really expensive to buy them all, but you know. Yeah, but it's interesting because on your website you talk about you know you, you can find you know you'll probably find yourself you know reading a book or you know doing you know that type of activity. I'm curious, what types of books um, have you enjoyed for the like? for the art of actual writing? Like who are some of the good writers out there that, mm. that you just read just to be like, it, it may not have to do anything with marketing, with business, all like, who do you like, that, who, who are some of those people that you like enjoy that are really good writers? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so right behind me are most of my psychology and business books. There's obviously the TV right there. I have some other business books here, biographies down here to my right is poetry and fiction. Um, and I, I tend to think about, books as being like, there's a lot of things people ask you when you say you read a lot of books. One is like, do you remember everything? It's like, of course not. Um, that is such a ridiculous idea to me. It's like, no offense, Jonathan, I'm not going to remember everything from this conversation. Doesn't mean it's not like super worthwhile and good, you know? And I tend to think it's like, man, you, you get the opportunity like Ogilvy, Ogilvy wrote, I think four books, maybe, a, maybe a little bit. I've read four of his books, right? One of the best advertisers of all time. I don't remember everything from those four books. I remember a lot. And I just think, man, how, how long do you think, how many hours do you think it'll take you to read Confessions of an Advertising Man? No wrong answers. This is not a leading question. Who, me? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how long it is. How long is it? It's a couple hundred pages. I think it's like a buck 60 or something. Yeah, I, I think if I were to actually... So, so, so I do two parts. So I actually, um, I do audiobooks first just to hear and, and see if it's actually good nice. worth reading and then what I do is based off of that then I actually take notes and figure out okay I, I'm actually going to buy this book so then that way I can actually take notes yeah. and then actually highlight stuff because some books are really good some of them aren't and so totally. um, I, I think it's hard to say 
depending on schedule, but I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, a couple hundred pages probably within a month, month and a half. Yeah. So like, let's say, and, and like, I love, I love that your slower is better as far as I'm concerned with reading. Let's say it's 20 hours to read that book. It'd be like, how much money would people pay for a 20 hour private class with David Ogilvy? Ab- absurd amounts of money, right? I couldn't afford it. And I would probably pay everything I could, right? It'd be like, there's, there's like a handful of marketers in the world who would pay, I don't know, six figures, whatever. And yet it's like how, like the flip side is it's like, well, I don't want to spend the time. Like, oh, reading's hard. It takes effort. It's like, yeah, that's the point. It's way less easy to read than it is to listen to a podcast, listen to an audio book. Like, but that effort is what makes it different. And in my opinion, it's what makes it stick. So it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, there's like some now I'm not in great shape, but it's just like, it's like, yeah, man, I figured out I can set the machine to five pounds and it's a lot easier than if it's set to 200. It's like, yeah, the entire point is that it takes effort to move weight. Like the entire point of the book is that it's not easy to read, but you are by doing that, you're shaping and training yourself in this conversation with these kind of goats. Um, to me, poetry is kind of my secret sauce. I don't really think I have secret sauce as a marketer. Secret sauce as an idea is overrated, but I don't talk to really any marketers who read poetry and poets to me are like Rilke. I like Yeats. uh, I like Keats. I like T.S. Eliot. um, I like B.H. Fairchild. Poetry is like, and this kind of crosses over into writing lyrics for music, but it's like how much meaning can you pack into the fewest possible words? And those words sound good and they're memorable and they stick in people's heads. And it's like, would the ability to do that be useful to you as a marketer? I think, I think so. So I'm just like, if you can, if you have the headspace for it, if you have the stomach for it, like I really do feel like poetry is a really interesting end to writing copywriting. Cause it's like a lot of times in copywriting, it's like, how can I say what other people say in 30 words in seven words? And like, that's a very like poetic oftentimes in my experience. Um, I'd also say uh, Ryan Holiday kind of writes some marketing stuff, but his writing style is very good, very modern. If you want to mimic it. Um, and, and I just like, uh, fiction wise, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, Don DeLeo, Martin Amos would be three names, um, that I think about a lot. Kurt Vonnegut for his humor, um, Martin Amos for his breadth. Those are, those are just one shots. I would say for me, poetry is kind of the thing I think I do that nobody else does. Yeah. And, And you began to touch into, you know, talking about, uh, you know, writing lyrics and music. And that's one of the, the uh, similarities we have is, you know, we're both musicians, yeah. but we're ro- both, we both have roles within marketing. And so I'm curious, how has music impacted your role as a marketer or vice versa? Yeah. Well, I got into the band that I play with by helping them with marketing first. Um, so that was a pretty direct, like there's a friend of mine has a band and then it was like, Hey, we have these questions about Facebook ads, how will we set this up? And then it was like, Hey, we need a guitar player for this gig. And then next thing you know, you're on like a month and a half long international tour. It's like, well, this could work. Um, I would say I've, I've thought, I've had this thought before that I don't think I would be the marketer I am without music. And I don't think I would be the musician I am without marketing. Um, the way those things interplay in my brain um, is I really do think that in a corporate environment, everybody hits a point where their professional development is limited by their personal development. What I mean is like you, you as a person, we, we all have some issues. That's okay. That's totally normal. Um, but you have a certain responsibility to work through those things and deal with those things. And my experience has been that eventually those things start to lit. If you don't work through those things, if you don't work through kind of your, your idiosyncrasies of the workplace or the fact that you don't feel very fulfilled in an area of your life, you're going to start bringing that to work and it's going to start limiting your ability to do stuff. Um, kind of to the point earlier about talking about patterns and days, the first one to one and a half hours of my day have nothing to do with work. Um, there are three books I read from I journal, um, and I go for a walk. None of those things have like tangible outputs, but what they do is they get me to the point where I feel like I've listened to me and I'm like intellectually, emotionally, and physically balanced enough to sit down and focus. Um, and so all that to say, I think that if I hadn't explored music or I'm not exploring music the way that I am, I would feel really unfulfilled. And that would leach over into my marketing life where maybe I would be trying things that are a horrible idea because I'd be wanting to do them out of some sense of like artistic fulfillment, not because they're what's best for the company or best for the campaign or best for the moment. Um, and I, I really see that in the people I really respect, I see them doing the work of like meeting their own needs 
outside of the workplace so that when they show up, they're ready to go. And in some of the shortcomings I've seen of the people I've worked with, it's where they're bringing a lot of their personal stuff to work. Not in a, hey, we're real humans and we should have a real relationship way, just like a, hey, maybe this corporate environment isn't a place for you to get your creativity out. Seems it's just like it's just not going to be a very happy for happy situation for anybody. That's that's really interesting that you say that. Um, right now, I'm actually some similar like you you had mentioned before we started hitting record that you guys are going to be recording soon some more music, and I actually started uh, just like a little project with with a buddy. Um, we write really well and easily together, and so it's interesting because nice. normally it's like majority of my stuff is work you know, getting work, you know, making, making it happen, but having that, you know, percentage of my week dedicated to just creating music. And, um, there are stresses that come with that too, because when things don't work out the way you don't want them to, you're going to like, man, I just need to keep doing, keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, you're just depleted. And then, but it's always good when you go a week later and you get to listen to what you created. You're like, wow, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I was able to, to produce that. And it's interesting that you say that. Cause I've, I heard this guy, um, he's, he's a drummer and he mentioned, and he was telling me about his band and he was saying, yeah, you know, our band is made up of, a. uh, an executive from a tech company, from a big tech company, a principal from this school. And like, it's interesting. You see these different, um, and, and and this may be like a future venture. Like I, I may want to find a way to do like business and then music, not necessarily like music business, but like people that are in business, but that are also in music, because I think there's a lot of interesting mm. um, aspects to that. But the point I'm, I'm trying to get to is like, I, I, I 100% agree. If you have that outlet that isn't only what you do every day and what you're getting paid for, I think it, it allows for you to be better at your work in the same way you're developing a skill that like now for me, like being in business and being in marketing, I'm realizing some creatives, actually a lot of creatives don't know how to sell what, what they're doing, sell the actual value of what they're doing. And I'm starting to learn that and grow and grow into that. It's not an easy thing to do, but there's a lot of value. So I, I'm, I'm glad you shared both of those paradigms because mm. I think they're super valuable. Mm. So, so now like to segue into the, the, towards the end, uh, you know, end of this discussion, um, I have two final questions before we go into the rapid fire questions. Um, so right, like, like, like I started the conversation, COVID-19 is, is a, is a real thing. It's impacting a lot of people. You mentioned it's not impacting you a lot, but I'm just curious, just from like an organizational standpoint, what characteristics, skills, or personality types, uh, do you think a marketer needs to, uh, be in order to be essential, especially like when people are getting furloughed left and right. Like what, what do mm-hmm. you perceive specifically for a marketer out there that still has their job or maybe it's furloughed? Like, what do you think those characteristics or skill yeah. are that really set them apart? Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. And I, I don't, I don't want to say the crap. Like many people are furloughed because they had the misfortune of working at a business that randomly, if you think about the random number of horrible things that could happen, their business isn't essential to people at home. And that's, you know, horrible and not your fault in no way. What I would say is, you know, there, there are pressures. When you work in an organization, there are pressures on you to do certain things, right? You, you got to be a part of the culture. You got to meet the dress code, right? There are, there are all sorts of things. And what I would say is like, you don't get paid to show up on time. You don't get paid to go to meetings. You don't get paid to follow dress code. You don't get paid for any of those things. Now you have to do those things. It's part of your job. You get paid to solve a problem for a business. And the more that you think about your skill set the way that you spend your time, um, the things that you consider to be important. Like what's more important to you, answering an email from your boss or blowing them off for three hours so you can actually get the meaningful work done that is going to solve a marketing problem like generate more leads or increase click-through. Most people, in my experience, um, and, and again, this is just my very limited marketing experience, most people spend way too much time worrying about the, oh my gosh, my boss emailed me, I have to get back to them right now. And they don't create the time to do the work. And my experience has been, even though, you know, I'm an adult with ADD and I drop the ball on all sorts of communication things, and I get myself into all sorts of trouble. My experience has been because I can deliver the work and there's not usually a lot of people who can deliver the work. Like, hey, we actually needed 10 emails. I wrote 10 emails. It's like, well, we need you. Um, and that that has been my experience that if you focus on even as a junior member, even as an individual contributor, what are the needs of the business and how am I helping to fill them? You are always going to be essential um, versus the people who spend a lot of the time worrying about the, what I'll call the more political stuff. That's me. That's me and my paradigm. It's worked for me. I'm not going to say it works for everyone, um, but in my experience, 
Um, focus on positioning yourself in terms of solving a problem for the business and the marketing team, not in terms of kind of the rote responsibilities. Yeah. So for, from a high level view, we've covered different aspects of your career, um, different vent, you know, different, you know, uh, obviously you have the side business that you're, you're doing with the heroes journal. You're at, you know, this tech company, you're doing a lot, you know, other freelancing stuff on the side. I'm curious. And, and you mentioned that your, you know, your story and, and the way you got to this point was, uh, more unconventional. It's you, you wouldn't recommend it and all these things, but I'm curious if, if you were to look at Zach when he was working at a restaurant and uh, you had an opportunity to talk to him, what advice would you tell him? Um, or, or give yourself, uh, you know, if you're to start over as a marketer. Yeah. Um, why don't I just say it's worth it? Like it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and a lot of times the work of becoming something you're not is the work of feeling like it's not working for a long time. Meaning it's not like it, the problem you run into is it's like, I read all these books, but I don't even know if it's going to help me right? It's not like I did something for a day and that didn't work. I can try something else tomorrow. It's like, you might have to try something for a year and then find out it was the wrong thing. Um, And so I would say to anybody in that position, just that um, it's going to take time. It's going to be probably harder than you think, but it is possible and it is worth it. Um, And even if you get to that point of being a marketer and you realize I hate this, um, you're still going to have more options for doing something else. Um, and so when it feels like it's not worth it, or you feel like you have no idea what to do, um, I just say, look, look for any good leaders. If you can find yourself under a good leader, under a good mentor, that's going to be the number one thing that gets you somewhere. Um, and then just stick at it because it it is worth it. Um, and know that you're doing something that's very difficult to do. Um, that would be what I would say to somebody in that position. That's, that's great advice. Stick through it, find a good mentor, but just be consistent and, that's a, I, I like that. So now tr- segueing into the last part of this conversation. So I have uh, just four rapid fire questions I want to ask you just, just more relating to marketing. And the first one is uh, what is your favorite marketing tool or software that you're using right now? Google documents. Yeah, it's a collaboration. If you, if it doesn't look good in Google docs, no amount of design is going to solve your bad copy. I, I, I like that. I've actually been, I don't know if you use it. I don't know if you need to use it, but I've been using the Hemingway app just to help oh, nice. me with like make, making things more straightforward, not trying to fluff things, just taking that out and being yeah. more direct. <laughs> um, That's awesome. so, I've never really used them, but I know some people who have had a lot of success um, using tools like that. Yeah. I, I, I've had a lot of success because I'm not good at grammar, all these things, but it has helped me for sure evolve as a marketer. Now you alluded to digital courses earlier. I'm curious, what's your favorite online marketing course that you've taken up to this point? Yeah, I'll go with copy hackers. Um, they're free. I mean, their paid stuff is really good too, but honestly that free course is a great crash course. And then go get on Ryan Holiday's re- uh, reading list. Um, he emails the books he's reading every month and I can't tell you how many great finds I've, I've gotten there. I actually need to do that. Yeah. Cause I've, I've read ego is the enemy. Um, nice. I, uh, what's the other one? The obstacles away. He has phenomenal writing. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll for sure check that out. I, I need to, he's do a big myself. reader and his, his recommendations are really good. Awesome. And, and now like, uh, what's your, uh, favorite all time, either business or marketing book that you've read up to this point? I will go with, um, Nassim Taleb, uh, anti-fragile. Um, but the entire Incerto series or Incerto, I don't know how it pronounces them. I N C E R T O. Uh, I'm actually, I just bought the box set and I'm rereading them right now. Um, they're not really marketing books, um, but they are the books that have most fundamentally shaped um, the way that I think about marketing and business. Um, and then anything by Robert Greene. I actually have two sections of myself that are books I've found because of Robert Greene via his bibliographies. Um, both. Yeah. Well worth your time. Yep. Yeah. Robert Greene's a mastery and, um, I can't remember what other books, the, 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 is it the 25 or was it 48, 48 laws 48, of power, 30, 33 strategies of war, laws of human nature, mastery. And then is, is Nassim, is he the one that wrote, sorry, this is kind of getting a little off track. Is he the one that wrote oh. the skin? Is it skin in the game or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I skin in the game is the things. fifth book in the series. Yeah. Awesome. Anti-fragile is my favorite. The all f- books are roughly around the same topics. Um, yeah, I would say if you're going to read one, read Anti-Fragile. It's also the longest one, though, and any of them are well worth reading. And kind of like read Skin in the Game, and if you fall in love with him, keep reading. And if you don't, you, you have a pretty decent 
grasp towards the ideas. Um, I think all five books are, are worth reading though. Great. And, and last question for the rapid fire questions is who's your favorite marketer, whether it's somebody, you know, directly or somebody you've admired from afar. Probably Ryan holiday. Um, because even though he's an author now, he, he was director of marketing for American apparel at like 22 years old, uh, maybe 24. I don't want to misspeak on his behalf. Not a friend of mine, just somebody I admire. Um, but he's somebody who gives advice and keeps it. Um, and his advice is well worth it. And he is still learning and growing. Um, and he's probably the person I look at the most. And if he does something, I'm probably going to try it. Um, just because it's been my experience that it's usually, he usually knows what he's doing. Um, and I just admire the path he's taken as a human and um, the life he's built. Yep. He's a phenomenal guy. A great guy to learn on stoicism too, if you're interested. Um, so, so if people are interested in learning more about you, what you do, obviously I listed off those websites, but is it like what platforms are you connected on or how can people reach out to you? Yeah. Uh, I think my emails on hirezackboyd.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, but I don't follow it. Um, yeah, I just say, check out, you know, if you're interested in checking out more about the heroes journal, 90 day productivity, uh, journal, uh, you just want to read more about our journey or what we built there. That's at the heroes journal.co. Um, and then if you want to reach out and contact me, my information's at hirezackboyd.com. Great. Awesome. Hey, Zach, I think, th- thank you so much for hopping on this call, sharing your, uh, your story, your, uh, unconventional, uh, you know, like story that obviously brought you to this point. And, and, and it's cool seeing like, you know, you mentioned how, you know, you were depressed, you dropped out of college, all these different things, but now talking to you and I'm sure there's, you know, life isn't perfect, but at the same time, it, uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure you could probably agree with, you know, it's gotten better and, and you've learned a lot. And so I just thank you for sharing oh, yeah. that. Cause I think that's valuable for me. I'm sure valuable for other people, but specifically for me, because I think there's a lot of preconceived notions, you know, like limiting beliefs, all these different things that you can't do, you know, certain things, but it, uh, going back to what you said is like, you know, doing like being consistent, knowing that it's going to be hard, but then also finding mentors. I think that's really valuable information. So thanks for hopping on this call once again and sharing all your experience and resources. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm going to tell everybody to follow rate, drop a like subscribe. Come on. It's free content. What are you doing? Help Jonathan out. Help him make more. I appreciate it, Zach. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll actually have to have a further conversation with you after we're done recording this call. But yeah, thank you everybody for listening. And uh, if, if any of this is a value to you, similar to what uh, Zach had just said, feel free to comment, like, share, and subscribe to Marketing Talks. Thank you.